what would be required for the argument to be any sort of challenge to you at all is that you accepted all of the premises and didn't accept the conclusion. And I've never come across an argument, cosmological, teleological, ontological, whatever, that has those properties. What's the view you take on free will? Because there's a lot of uh, dispute on the kind of views you've taken on free will, on the positions you've had. So what's the view you take now? Um, so I'm not sure that my view about free will has changed very much. So uh, the, pr probably the most important thing is to distinguish between different conceptions of freedom. So um, some people think that freedom requires um, something like um, alternative possibilities so that um, an action is free or a decision is free just in case in the very circumstances of the action something else could have come out right something else could have been the could have been the outcome whereas um, on uh, compatibilist conception of freedom it's not really important to whether something's a free act or a free decision whether at the point where the thing emerged something else could have emerged instead so that there were real alternative possibilities what matters according to me for free decision and free action is that the actions are uh, the product of your normally acquired beliefs, desires, intentions, and so on, in the absence of certain kinds of defeating conditions. So, for example, you don't act freely if you've been brainwashed or you're drugged or you're locked up or um, you're kind of the victim of an evil neuroscientist who's put implants in your brain and is kind of steering you around and so on. But taking those um, defeating conditions aside, what matters for your actions to be free is just that you're acting on your normally acquired beliefs, desires, intentions, and so on. So that's that's what I think freedom is. So of course I think we have freedom because that's all freedom is. Uh, but I don't think that um, we have freedom in the kind of the libertarian sense. That is that when you act, there's a bunch of different things that could be the outcomes. One of them is the outcome. There's lots of other things that could have been, and there's nothing that explains why you get one outcome rather than the others. I don't think that that gives you freedom at all. Anyway, that's so, and I think that that's kind of consistently been my view about freedom. Do you understand uh, the view, or do you have a comment on the view? Because uh, that Craig and David Hunt and I think Linda Zagzebski affirm because they, the way you've described libertarian free will, it seems like you understand it to presuppose the principle of alternative possibilities, right? And they have this view where they reject the principle of alternative possibilities, I think for the usual reasons, things like Frankfurt cases. But they still want to contrast their position uh, against compatibilism and say that they hold to some kind of libertarian view. I don't know if you've you've read about, uh, about uh, this position. Um, yes, I've I'm familiar with those positions. I think that they're mistaken in thinking that their views are not compatibilist, though. Because I see. So you think they misdescribe because, their own view? Yeah, that's that's what I think. Okay, thank you. And Dr. Oppie, um, there's a couple of uh, other questions that relate to um, your conception of necessary existence, basically. So you have uh, you are an atheist who believes that there is a necessary existence. Now, that's a view that's been controversial. I'm sure you know. But um, before we go any further into questions, do you want to explain exactly what you mean when you say that you as an atheist believe in necessary existence? Um, so, sure. 
I think that uh, in the kind of broadest terms, if you think about causal history, there's about four options. There might be an infinite regress of causes. It might be, I mean, alternative to that, there's a beginning, there's a first cause. That first cause might be necessary or it might be contingent. Uh, when we're thinking about the first cause or the, the first state and the things in it, we might be thinking just about its existence being necessary, or we might also be thinking that the properties that it's got are necessary as well. So that's how you end up with this, this roughly four ways that you can go, um, it seems. Now, if you th when I think about the four ways, uh, the one that seems the least unattractive, or maybe that's the right way to put it to me, is to suppose that the starting point, the things in the starting point exist of necessity and have their properties of necessity. Uh, that seems to me the neatest um, um, theory. And so tentatively, that's the theory I'm inclined to accept. And it's important to remember what the alternatives are here. Um, it's not like I'm certain that it's the best view. It's just that if you force me to make a choice, that's the way I'm going to go. Dr. Oppie, are you able to hear me right now? Yep. Is my voice coming in? Clear? Okay, good. Yeah, so, um, Doc has a question, but before that, can I can I clarify something, uh, if that's possible? Um, when you say necessary existence, you mean something that cannot fail to exist in any possible world. Is that correct? Um, yes. I although I think that I mean just just to be clear about this, that the necessity idiom is more primitive than the possible worlds idiom. I don't really believe in possible worlds. I believe um, that talking about possible worlds is just a kind of neat, vivid way of talking about necessity. But necessity, possibility, contingency are the more basic notions. I see. I see. That's um, yeah. And uh, do you do you want to comment why this has been such a controversial view among uh, some of the atheist philosophers to uh, accept some sort of necessary existence? Uh, I think. Okay, so I'm happy to speculate about this, but it is just speculation. Uh, in the in the first part of the 20th century, I mean, right right up until the early 60s, I think that um, the notions of necessity and a priority and analyticity were not well understood amongst analytic philosophers, and there's a view that what's necessary it has to be a logical truth, for example. And so it has to be a priori and it has to be analytic as well as necessary. Um, and it's not very plausible that um, the existence of whatever is <laughs> there at the beginning, assuming that there's a necessary existence at the beginning of causal reality, that we can know a priori that there's such a thing that it's merely a logical truth, that there's such a thing um, that it's an analytic truth that there's such a thing. It wasn't until uh, really Kripke's work and other people, um, and pe before that, people like um, Ruth Marcus as well, in the 50, from the from the 50s onwards. It wasn't until their work really um, became widely accepted that um, it became clear that it was okay to think that. The, the beginning exists of necessity, that you weren't committing yourself to claims that are just implausible on their face. Right, so the idea here is that, assuming that it is necessary, we only know about it a posteriori. It's only, I mean, following the process that I described before in the earlier part of the conversation, when you look at the theories and you work out which is the best theory, it turns out that the best theory is one that's got the necessary origin. And so that's your reason for thinking that there's a necessary origin, right? It's it's based on your weighing up of all of the evidence. So it's an a posteriori judgment, even though it's a judgment about necessity. Yeah. 
that's um that's a very comprehensive answer, Dr. Appy. I wish I could convey in words how much I appreciate it. Um Okay, Dog has a question for you. A uh, person who goes by the unit's name of Dog, I should I'd say. Dog, why don't you step up? Yeah, so I actually, uh, by the way, thank you for coming today, Dr. Appy. I had several questions. My first question is simply um, in regards to your view on universals. Um, do you just hold the view that there aren't any universals simpliciter or like... For example, can properties be universals? Like, let's say if I, the red in my car and the red in my water bottle, if they're quantifiably the same and qualitatively look the same, uh, you don't, do you not think that they would be the same, like red, the same type? Would, would you, like, do you think that there are just tokens, but not really any types in nature? Like, they're sort of just a man made concept? Uh, so there, there are lots of different versions of what you might call nominalism. Uh, there's a bunch of them that were articulated in a book that David Armstrong wrote in the, I guess it was back in the 70s, different kinds of nominalism, um, conceptual nominalism, verbal nominalism, and so on. I'm, all of those views are still kind of too metaphysical for, for, my, for my liking. The kind of view I like is the one that, um, Stephen Yablo defended in a bunch of papers huh. that he wrote sort of around the beginning of this millennium. Yeah. Uh, uh, so his figuralist view, where um, roughly the idea is that um, we only have the, the vocabulary that we use that makes it, that seems to commit us to universals because it enables us to say things that it would be very tedious to say if we didn't have that new vocabulary. But the new vocabulary doesn't carry any ontological commitments with it. So um, a simple model here, um, consider um, what Quine says about truth. Quine says there's no metaphysics about truth. It's not like the correspondence theory of truth is required. The point about the word truth is that Try saying everything the Pope says is true. Try saying that um, if you don't have the truth predicate, right? It's a, what, what you will end up saying is something that's kind of infinitely complicated. If the Pope says that grass is green, then grass is green. And if the Pope says that grass is purple, then grass is purple, and so on, right? This infinite conjunction. Mm -hmm. The purpose of the truth predicate is just to avoid having to say, it makes it possible to say things that we couldn't say because we couldn't express that infinite conjunction. Uh, and I think that talk about properties goes the same way. Um, the, the, the reason why we have um, uh, nominalization and talk about properties is just to make it possible to say certain kinds of things that otherwise we would un end up expressing using infinite conjunctions and infinite disjunctions. But I don't think that there's any ontology that goes along with it. Now, I realize that's pretty programmatic as a kind of explanation, but that's, that's really what's in the background. That's the kind of nominalism that I like. Um, but uh, then, well, but then, uh, yeah, and then in the case of like, like if you saw, like, let's say, like, back to the red example, yeah. but wouldn't there be like more explanatory power on the at least like semi universalist or like semi moderate realist views? Like, if let's just say, uh, let's say I, I don't hold to universals regarding substances, but I do regarding certain properties, it seems like saying. Asking, well, why is that red and that red? What, why do we think that they're so similar, right? Because um, they seem to, to appear very similar to us. It seems like under the, uni uh, the universal uh, view, right, the realist view, I could just say, well, that's because they're the same color, right? They're the same type. Like, I don't need to appeal to just saying, well, it's just cultural, right? Like, that red isn't really the same as that red. They're just, you know even though they're quantifiably and qualitatively the same to us, right? Like they appear that way. 
So I think that the kind of primitive judgments here will be ones about indiscriminability and the explanation about the indiscriminability will appeal to very, will appeal to um, not, not, not to the possession of um, properties like, so suppose we've got, you, you were thinking we've got two red balls and yeah, um, yeah. And, and it, what we're going to say is that they that the the redness is the same in the two balls. That's what you want to say. But there's a there's a there's a much more informative though rather more complicated explanation about um, the surfaces of the surface reflectance properties of the balls and the transmission of photons to the eyes of the 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 perceiver and the processing that's going on in their brain and so on. That stuff is all definitely there it's common on any sensible picture about what's going on and once you think about all of that picture the need to suppose that there are you know the, the idea that appealing to um, universals uh, the universals of redness to explain the judgments about um, similarity is going to be redundant because we'll get we'll get um, a much more complete explanation out of the kind of underlying um, scientific theories in that case. So that's, at least that's my kind of suspicion. All right, Doug, if you have more questions, just DM me, uh, we'll get back to you. Um, yeah, de definitely, anybody can get on voice. I, I don't know how much time you have, Dr. Oppie, we certainly don't want to take much more. Uh, Jack, are you back? Jack? Right, maybe Jack isn't back. Yeah, I'm here. Uh, Okay, so let me just read questions actually that were asked. But before that, Timber had a question to ask you on voice, Professor Oppie, and uh, he joins us now here. Timber. Oh, hi. Um, so you mentioned before that uh, theory comes before arguments, or that's your preferred way of t discussing. Um, but I just want to, but it seems like in order to compare theories, don't we first need to sort of agree on the data? Um, and if so, isn't there sort of a worry for this particular mode of discussion that the data itself is going to be theory laden? So, for example, wouldn't a Christian think that the resurrection of Jesus is, for example, a data point that needs explanation that atheists would dispute? And we could imagine for many other such disputes, we're going to have various different disagreements about the data. So I'm just worried that if we proceed this way, it's, we're not really, theory isn't really coming before arguments. It's rather we're just arguing about the data. Um, I'm just worried if, wondering if that's a concern. So I think that uh, it's an interesting question how you should think about the data. So what I'm inclined to do is to think, okay, you've got this total conception on each side of all the things that are true, and there's masses of agreement, right? And all the stuff that you agree on, that's going to be the data. So we, the, it's it's not a datum that there was a resurrection. What's a datum is that we've got a small number of texts that report that there was a resurrection. And then we see um, which view has the better explanation of why those texts report what they do. So that was kind of the way that I want to deal with the problem that you're raising. Now, it could happen that you come up against, um, you know, You've got your theory and you, you meet someone and there's just hardly any, I mean, in, in principle, you could imagine this happening. There's hardly anything um, that you agree about. So then you just don't have any data. Then I suspect um, there's going to be kind of no interesting meeting of the mind and no way that you can kind of put together um, a mutually satisfying discussion. But that doesn't seem all that surprising as an outcome but also in practice that doesn't happen in practice mm -hmm. we're all commit we, we can like even if we can't agree that there was a resurrection we can certainly agree that there's a bunch of texts that say that there were and we can just treat that as the data i see um okay so i mean do you think that there's like that there's any kind of principal criteria that we could use to say what is data but that isn't going to be really theory laden, or you think it's just something we just well just agree we just have vast we just have vastly more agreement than disagreement about what counts, and we just focus on what we agree on. 
something so, like that. So, yeah, that's what I think we do. So, I mean, if 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 there's a disagreement between us, if we're going to try to make any progress on resolving our disagreement, we better first of all identify a whole range of stuff that we agree on. Otherwise, there's just no prospect of going forwards. So, yeah, that would be, I think that would be my answer. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Timber, uh, so much. Uh, Professor Oppie, um, there is a couple of questions about um, what you believe the best response is to um, traditional arguments for God. So what would be your, um, well, let's say, the traditional objection to the cosmological argument and the teleological argument. And um, we will save the ontological for later, but for now, the top two ones that have been used, well, actually three, but we're going to concentrate on two, which are cosmological and teleological since the times of Aristotle. How can you, of course, a couple of minutes won't do it justice, but basically, what would be the summary of uh, where you think these arguments fail and uh, what they fail to accomplish? Thank you. Okay, so... I, maybe I can start off by saying something really general. So when, when you've got um, an argument with the conclusion that God exists, uh, if, if you're a, a non-believer, odds are uh, that assuming that the argument is a valid argument, so the conclusion's really supported by the premises, that you're just going to reject one or more of the premises. And what would be required for the argument to be any sort of challenge to you at all is that you accepted all of the premises and didn't accept the conclusion. And I've never come across an argument, cosmological, teleological, ontological, whatever, um, that has those properties. And so that will be the kind of um, the short answer. The kind of interesting question is, okay, pick a particular argument, pick a particular cosmological argument or a particular teleological argument or a particular argument from morality or whatever and say, okay, so uh, here, here's the bunch of premises in this argument. What do you say about these premises? And then you pick out the one or the ones that you don't accept. So that's that's a kind of general answer. Let's go back to, because you asked me in particular about cosmological arguments. Yeah, and, and teleological. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. But cos cosmological arguments are easier, given what I've already said, because uh, I, the, it, it, for for some of the cosmological arguments, I might actually accept all of their premises and accept the conclusion. If the conclusion is that there's a kind of necessary origin, well, I don't dispute that. I just think that that's the beginning of the universe or the beginning of natural reality. So um, there are some cosmological arguments, it depends how they're set up and what their conclusions are, where I'm just going to say, yep, that's a sound argument, but it doesn't establish a conclusion that um, is any threat to naturalism. Other cosmological arguments have the conclusion that God exists, so it depends how you formulate the arguments. And in those cases, um, there'll be some premise that I'll point to and say, oh, I just don't accept that one. And that's how it always turns out. I mean, that's not to say that it's impossible. Like, you know, in the future, I could be wrong about everything and someone could give me an argument with all true premises and the conclusion that God exists. Um, that's clearly a theoretical possibility, but I'm not kind of, I don't think that that's in the card. So uh, Josh wants to ask you a question. Um, to you, uh, what do you mean by brute necessity? How is it different than brute contingency? And in what modality is it necessary? Right. So uh, it's pr probably my view is that calling something a brute necessity is kind of redundant. Um, ne what's necessary is what's true no matter what. But if it's true no matter what, then there's just no explanation. For it, because that would be postulating a a what. So, wh what I mean then really is that where you put necessities into your theory, uh, those are just theoretical costs. Every time you put a necessity in there, it's a theoretical cost. 
because it's something that um, there's not some further thing that you can appeal to to explain it. Now, you might, instead of postulating necessities, you might replace them with brute contingencies. You might say, look, it could have been otherwise, but there's no explanation for why it's the way it is rather than, than, than some other way that it might have been. Right, so that would be a brute contingency. That seems to me less, in general, less satisfactory than going for a necessity. But um, it's, I think, quite a difficult philosophical question to say exactly why, right? The, where, where you've got a brute contingency, there are other possibilities and there's nothing that explains why it's the way it is rather than other ways it could have been. If you say it's necessary, then you've ruled out there being other possibilities. Um, maybe that feels better to me, but the kind of downside has to do, at least what part of the downside has to do with um, the way that lots of my colleagues, philosophical colleagues think about um, possibility, that we should suppose that the, you know, the more possibilities, the better, right? Um, because Pretty much, if you can imagine something, that's a sort of reason for thinking that it's possible. Uh, I kind of like the idea of minimising the possibilities instead and saying, in order to think that something's possible, you've got to have a reason for thinking that it's possible. That's not a kind of, it's a, by no means a universal view in philosophy. In fact, it's probably a kind of minority view, but that's a view I like. Can I follow up on some of the things that you just said there? Yeah. So, sure. so one thing that um, confuses me about what you're saying is, well, first of all, I, I don't think you answered the question about modality. Is it just, I, I mean, there's a phrase out there, um, but maybe you know what I'm talking about. Is it just metaphysical? Because like, certainly you wouldn't say like, it's some sort of logical necessity. So. The brute necessity, there's some, some sort of metaphysical necessity, or would you go as strong as saying that, you know, your naturalistic view is um, logically necessary? Uh, so, if it's not a narrow logical necessity, it's not a theorem of logic. I know it's something that we talked about a little bit earlier on. So, I am thinking about it as um, metaphysical. Right. So the idea was it's the it's a theoretical postulation, um, and it's certainly not a priori or analytic or a matter of logic. I'm not thinking about the necessities that way. Okay. Um, I think I could follow up about the uh, about the broad and narrow scope there because I, I I think I understand those differently than a lot of a lot of people might, but. Um, I won't get bogged down in that issue. Uh, one one thing I wanted to ask is about the reasons for thinking that something is possible. It sounds to me like you're conflating epistemic possibility with um, with metaphysical possibility. Because I think on your view, if you think that anything is necessary, I mean, I, I don't understand how you know it's, it's not the case that just modal collapse follows from that right unless there are also unless there are some necessary facts and then some also brute contingent facts right but then when you suggest that something is possible is the is the idea there like if you take uh, let's take quantum mechanics as, as a yep. you know a, a paradigmatic example of something like this right so the idea that there that maybe the naturalistic state of affairs is necessary but that any uh you know decay of like an alpha particle or whatever that's going to be some sort of brute contingency but we know about the space of like we, there, maybe there's some sort of inductive inference about the space of like whether or not some particle will decay the probability space so is that the kind of idea that you're thinking about well we know it's possible that this particle decays or it's, it's possible that it doesn't decay and that's just some sort of inductive inference from uh, past particles or something like that. So that's the reason that we have to think that those are the two possibilities. 
So I'm thinking something very much along the lines that you um, just outlined. So every possible world starts from the same initial state. The possible worlds diverge only because chances play out differently. So you've got a chancy evolution of state of the universe. The reason for thinking that is because, at least on some interpretations of quantum mechanics, it looks like the evolution of state is chancy. But you can't have chances unless you've got possibilities. And so this is what I meant about you've got to have a reason for possibilities. The only reason that you've got for supposing that there are possibilities, according to me, is because you think there are chances. So you think that there's indeterministic causation. And so that fills out, if, you, if you're if thinking for a kind of model about what modal space looks like, it's the kind of branching tree that people like Storrs McCall postulated. Yeah. yeah. Uh Josh, is that all? Okay. Yeah, I'll I mean, that, I think that's enough to answer the question. It's There's no conflation between, I deny that there's a conflation between epistemic and um, um, yeah. ontological considerations here. I, it's very clear, I'm talking about metaphysical possibilities. I don't really like talking about epistemic possibilities. Um, I don't th think that that's really a kind of modality. That's something else that I would like to handle in a different way. Um, Dr. Appy, a little bit of a light hard question, I guess, but uh, has kind of implications, I guess. Who do you consider the most formidable theist philosopher today? I don't know. Formid formidable is kind of a, a hard word. There are lots of there are lots of theist philosophers that I like. There are some that I get on with really well. Uh, there are lots of them who are really good. So, um, so I've so let me mention two. So I really like Josh Rasmussen. Um, I've had a bunch of good conversations with him. I've recently written a book. It'll be out in a few months. So kind of debate about the existence of God book with Kenny Pierce. He's another um, um, Christian philosopher that I really like and um, I think is really terrific. But there are lots. I have lots of friends in philosophy. Oh, I see. Um, Dr. Appy, another question that came in. Uh, do you grant uh, that theists are rational uh, as uh, as far as uh, their philosophy is concerned? So, do you believe theism is right? Do, do you believe theism is rational? And uh, the second question is, which I just tied together, are the do you grant that theists are rational? So. I mean, I think I'll answer that question this way. Um, pick any kind of worldview and think about the way that rationality is distributed over the proponents of the worldview. Some of them will be totally irrational and they'll be irrational in holding the worldview. Um, some of them will be rational and they'll be rational in holding the worldview. I mean, for any kind of established worldview, there's going to be some distribution like that. I don't think that there's any reason to think that in general, theists have got to be kind of more irrational than non-theists. You see, yeah. that's uh, yeah, that's a very comprehensive answer. That's a very interesting answer, I suppose. Okay, another question that we wanted to ask you, Dr. Oppie, and I hope Jack is here because I uh, want him to hear this. Basically, um, in philosophy of language, um, What's your thoughts on direct reference theory? Do you accept uh, the causal reference theory, sometimes known as the direct reference theory? Why or why not? Please. Uh, okay, so this is going way back. So I wrote my dissertation about this topic. Uh, I'm not sure how much I need to explain the background to it to make it accessible to people who are listening. Um, I so so. I, it, the answer is sort of yes and no, because the, in the debate between Fragians and Russellians, roughly speaking, the kind of the, the people who, who um, believed in modes of presentation being part of semantics and the people like Salmon and Soames who think that modes of presentation have got nothing to do with semantics, but they only come up in pragmatics. I fell on the Fragian side not because I rejected direct reference, but because I rejected a principle called semantic innocence. And 
I mean, I don't know whether, I don't know if you really want me to try and explain this or not. It's, um, it's something I haven't thought about since about 1994. I, I actually I I was thinking no, just, you... just just a, just just a minute before you get we get to a new question I just want to uh, ask on this one yes um yeah we'll get to you just just a minute though yes uh Dr Rappi um that was a comprehensive answer but here is a question I want do you believe that the um, view that Putnam and Kripke espoused the the sort of robust externalism do you think um you disagree with that view do you have your objections to that view. Um, so I don't think that I object to the kind of externalism about content. I don't think that I object to that. Okay, I see. I understand. Um, so Josh, okay, uh, as long as it's not a really long question, go ahead. No, I just, I, I was thinking uh, while I was muted about what you had said, and it seems to me that uh, on your view on naturalism, things that have to be necessary are probably like the physical laws or what has to be necessary. So whatever is hypothetically consistent with our physical laws would be something that would be a reason for us to, to think is possible. Is that sort of like your view? Because I, I, I can't see how the physical uh, laws not being necessary on a view like the view that you have would make any sense. Yeah. So, so I certainly think that, I mean, if we're going to go along with laws as part of our ontology, then I think the laws are necessary, but it's not just consistency with the laws because I think the initial conditions are necessary too, right? The only way that contingency comes in is because the evolution of state is chancy on my preferred view. And of course, it might turn out that there are reasons why this won't fly, like I mean, it might turn out eventually to be inconsistent with best physical theory to suppose that that's how it is, in which case, you know, who knows, maybe infinite regress or, you know, or just contingent origin or whatever. It's important to the view that the evolution of state is chancy because otherwise, as I think you said before, you will just get modal collapse, especially given that I want sort of boundary conditions and laws both to be necessary. I didn't, uh, I didn't, I wasn't presupposing uh, ontology in my question about laws. I was just saying that insofar as there is, I mean, it depends on what you, what, what you think of yeah. like you know, ontology. I was just thinking like, even if you had a human view, like a view of constant conjunction, it's just insofar as things are deterministic, like 100% deterministic in this universe, they're going to be 100% deterministic in all universes, right? Is That's kind, that's yeah. kind of what I was thinking. Yeah, well, that, that's certainly true. But if if you've got if you've got necessity of the laws and the initial conditions, so we're thinking determinism plus fixed starting point, only one starting point, you'll end up with modal collapse from that. Yes, uh, Dr. Abby, that's um, that's a wonderful question, a wonderful, um, comprehensive answer as you've been. I mean, I, I had no doubt, but, you know, I mean, um, just hearing you answer these questions so comprehensively, um, as a philosophy enthusiast myself who, uh, you know, read philosophy every day, it's, it's just really amazing to see. Um, how well you handle questions like this. So, um, yeah, we have another one. Um, we have another question, and this is about uh, specifically the ontological argument, a uh, modal ontological argument, especially. Um, and the question is: Can you briefly summarize what was the problems you found with um, the modal reformulation of this uh, very storied and long argument? And um, do you believe it's time to completely give up for us to completely give up trying to reformulate it, or do you believe it could p potentially? Uh, be saved. Okay, so the the kind of core to the modal ontological argument is the idea that um, kind of necessarily, if God exists, God exists of necessity. So there are two possibilities, either two possibilities in 
the, the following sense. There's two different models that we can make. Either it's the case that God exists in all possible worlds, or it's the case that God exists in no possible world. Right? That's, they're, they're the two models. I mean, it's not really right to say they're both possibilities, right? Because, but, but, so I'll avoid saying it like that. So either God exists in all possible worlds or God exists in no possible worlds, and which, which model is correct is sort of up for grabs. Now, the proponent of the modal ontological argument wants to argue as follows. God exists in at least one possible world. It's possible that God exists. So God exists in all worlds. It's in particular God exists. All right. And you might think, well, that maybe that looks like a good argument. But remember that the alternative that was on the table was God exists in no worlds. Um, God doesn't exist in at least one world. Therefore, God exists in no worlds. There's another argument that leads you to the conclusion that God doesn't exist. It just starts from the claim that it's possible that God doesn't exist. So if we consider the key premises here, on the one hand, it's possible that God exists. On the other hand, it's possible that God doesn't exist. Um, it's not clear why anybody who thought that God exists would be tempted by the premise that it's possible that God doesn't exist. And anyone who thought that God doesn't exist would be tempted by the premise that it's possible that God does exist. It looks as though the two arguments are kind of on a par, which is just to say they're both equally ineffective. That's the kind of, I think, the standard reply to a modal ontological argument. I see. That is one. That is great. So, uh, Isaac, um, uh, Isaac, please uh, take it away. Please. Um... Sure. Uh, hi, Graham. Nice to meet you. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah, sure. Hi. Hi. So I actually was curious, I guess CC has sort of tried to spark a bit of conversation between you and Jack. I'm curious if Jack delivers his sort of take on metaphysical possibility, what you make of it. Can you, can you ask the question again? Sorry. Yeah, I, I'd, well, Jack's presumably there right now, um, right? Yeah, Jack is slightly away for a little bit. I guess we'll have to wait till he comes back. Um, yeah, because what, what I'd be interested in is I think that you guys have disagreements around metaphysical possibility. I wouldn't be able to describe his view properly, but I'd be very curious well, to I see what... I'm what not, yeah. I don't really... Un I mean, Dr. Appy wants to say that... I take it you, you think that there's some notion of... Um, Necessity and possibility, which is kind of like um, a uh, pretty theoretical, and that you're just saying that this notion of metaphysical possibility that you have, which is that um, everything that shares um, a common causal origin, that that, that initial origin point um, if it's necessary counts as uh, what you mean by metaphysical necessity as opposed to you know logical or conceptual necessity so I'm, not that sure right? that it's, I'm not sure that it's pre-theoretical so um, I'm one of the things that philosophers disagree about is what's the right account of necessity or what's the right way of explaining the kind of acceptable ways that we talk about what's necessary and what's possible. Um, and one of the kind of important things when we're thinking about the way we talk is to kind of separate out where what we're talking about is doxastic or epistemic from where it's metaphysical. And I think that a kind of neat way to divide this stuff up is the way that I go. So where I make the space of metaphysical possibility fairly small. Um, and if you want to talk that way, the space of um, you know, epistemic possibility may be quite large, but that's a, a different question. Uh, so 
I'm not sure that it's pre-theoretical, uh, but um, it's important. I mean, part of what I like to do is to have some way of accommodating all the disagreements that people make to kind of make sense of the disagreements. And unfortunately, um, pretty much everything in philosophy is controversial, in particular, how to explain the ways that we talk about assessing impossibilities controversial. I mean, I guess the part that seems sort of odd to me is that it sounds like what you're saying is your preferred view is that the um, starting point for natural reality, the uh, initial conditions and so on, is metaphysically necessary, but <clears throat> logically contingent. Is that right? Um, I'm saying... Would I say that it's logically contingent? I don't know that I want to talk that way. What I want to say is you certainly, it's certainly not um, a theorem of logic or something that you can figure out entirely a priori on the basis of no data whatsoever or something that's just so because of the meanings that we give to the words that there's a necessary origin. Right? So um, what I want to say is that it's metaphysically necessary that there's such an origin, um, well, given subject to the qualifications I gave earlier, right? I mean, it's my preferred view, but I'm not going to die in a ditch for it. Um, the, it's, it's definitely a controversial view, and um, lots of people are going to disagree about it, and I certainly don't want to say that their views are ruled out a priori or by logic or by the meanings of our words or whatever. Um, if we're going to compare the views um, and try to arrive at an assessment of which one's better, it's going to be using the same methodology that I want to use everywhere. So we just elaborate the theories and then we try to compute the theoretical virtue of the competing views. Well, maybe just one one other question um, in this context to help clarify. So you said that you you take the idea that um, the starting point for natural reality as being metaphysically necessary is sort of like what you would say at the point of a gun, and you're open to the possibility that it's actually contingent. I presume you, by contingent there you mean brutally contingent if there's no sort of infinite um, infinite chain of uh, causal explanations. Um, there'd be no initial point, I guess, if that were the case. So if there is an initial point, you're open to it being brutally contingent. And I guess what I'm trying to understand is what what it really means to say that it's, like, what, if, if, whether there's something informative that can be said to distinguish the two options, the one in which it's brutally contingent and the one in which it's metaphysically necessary, because it seems like the only way to do that, that's obvious to me, is to think about that in terms of conceptual necessities. Um, but it seems like you were resistant to that characterization. So I'm just wondering if there's something informative you could say about, I mean, are you just saying that there's nothing more to say other than one is metaphysical, other than that on one view, the uh, starting point for natural reality is metaphysically necessary, and on the other view, it's brutally contingent? Or can you, can you actually characterize what that actually means in some further, through some further elaboration. Um, I don't know whether this will help or not. You can, I mean, you can, so let's, let, let's suppose that our modal logic is S5. You can make a kind of S5 model in which it's clear that um, every world 
shares the same origin. You can make an S5 model in which it's clear that different worlds have, you know, the, the origins of different worlds have different properties so that the origin's not necessary. That's a way of kind of spelling. Maybe you think though that that's just a way of spelling out what it means to say on the one hand that it's necessary, on the other hand that it's contingent, but doesn't do it in a way that you would count as informative. I one thing I don't want to do is say that these are both possibilities because I don't think that I don't think that that makes sense. But what is true is that there are plenty of people who have held the view that there's a, a brutally contingent origin, right? And I mean, it's, it's a very common view amongst atheists right up to the present. And so you wanna be able to talk about the views. So if there was a modality here, it's something like, um, you know, it's possible for philosophers reasonably to maintain that or something like that would be the, the kind of overarching modality. So it's not quite epistemic. Maybe it's maybe it's kind of a special kind of doxastic thing. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks. That was the discussion I was sort of hoping to see. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, Dr. Rappi, for that uh, wonderful explanation. I have a question. Um, uh, what are your thoughts briefly on Dr. William Lane Craig and his work? Um, so, um, where to start? So he's he's very. I, I think he's a good philosopher. Um, I know Bill reasonably well. Um, I've known him for quite a long time. Uh, I'm. I had lunch with him a couple of times and had conversations with him about various kinds of things. He's got, he's incredibly um, productive. So he's got a vast output. Um, anybody, and so this applies to me as much as it does to him, anybody who writes that much stuff, it's of slightly variable quality. So some of it's better than others. He's written some really good um, stuff that's been published in great journals. Uh, there's stuff that we agree about. So if you've seen, uh, there was a there was a book that we both contributed to on God and ab abstract objects, um, and it turns out that we're both kinds of fans of Steve Yablo's version of nominalism, and um, there's quite a lot of common ground there. There's a bunch of other areas where we've got uh, common ground. Some, in some ways, we've actually, I think, had influence on each other, which has led to some convergence of our views as well. Uh, of course, there's lots of things that I disagree with him about um, quite strongly, perhaps more in kind of political areas than in kind of metaphysical areas. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Rappi, for that response. So uh, without further ado, Youth Resist, um, you're up. Oh, Youth Resist isn't here. I better ping him. Okay, uh, in the meantime, uh -huh. there's another question. Dog, uh -huh. just a second. Dog, okay. meet your microphone. Okay. Um, <clears throat> one question, uh, Dr. Rappi, for you. Do you believe idealism can be rescued, or is it a done deal? So I've written a paper against idealism in which I argue that um, a kind of naturalistic realism is just a better view than idealism. I think of idealism as a kind of scepticism. I think of it as a kind of um, way of denying that there's an external causal, that there's an external world. Uh, on the way that I think about idealism, say the theistic idealism, what there is, is just minds with God being the kind of big super mind that feeds um, experiences to the other minds. And that's, that's what reality is. 
So on that view, it seems to me there aren't all of the things that we think of as being part of the external world. There aren't trees, right? There's just kind of tree representations in the minds. That seems to me to be a kind of scepticism, which I don't like. Yes, that's wonderful. Uh, Dr. Oppie, um actually I had a little bit of a personal stake in this because I consider myself an idealist. So um, I guess mm, that's the answer I have to live with. Okay, Youth Resist, you're up. Please go ahead. Uh, Dr. Oppie, this is a 15-year-old Christian person who is a big fan of your work. He admires your intelligence and your work, and he would like to uh, ask you your questions directly on voice. Go ahead, Youth. Hello, Dr. Afi. Thank you for your time. And I would like to ask you a question on theoretical virtues, since in your case for naturalism specifically, using theoretical virtues to compare different metaphysical theories is really essential to your case. So what I wanted to know, at least from your point of view, is what would be the criterion by which we would evaluate a theoretical virtue or a possible theoretical virtue and say that it is a valid way of evaluating different metaphysical theories? Right, so so that's a really good question. Uh, uh, and I'm not sure that I'm going to have a satisfactory answer to that question. What I think is that it's kind of obvious that uh, when we're comparing theories, that on the one hand, it's a good thing to try to minimise your commitments, and on the other hand, it's a good thing to try to explain as much as you can. And that when we're comparing comparing theories, we see which one the, we should prefer the one that does best at the trade-off between those two tasks. Right? You could you can imagine um, a theory that takes every bit of data as just a primitive, right? And then it explains everything, but at maximal cost. So that would be a kind of bad theory, um, right? That was that was. Um, Sorry, that, let me start again. You can imagine a theory that postulates nothing, so it can't explain anything, right, because it's got no explanatory resources. So a kind of nihilism, there isn't anything, is going to be a kind of as bad as a theory can get. On the other hand, you can imagine a theory that for each bit of data postulates something new to explain that bit of data, and that, that theory will be kind of as expensive as it's possible for a theory to be. Right, because it's got a new, it posits new stuff for each bit of data. It seems to me sort of obvious that the best that the best theories are going to be somewhere in the middle. They're going to make some kind of decent trade-off between um, minimising the number of posits that you make and maximising how much you explain. It might be that the best theory you can come up with is going to leave a few things unexplained. It might be that the best theory that you come up with is fairly complicated. Explain it postulates quite a lot of things. Okay, so I think those two things and that way of thinking about how you balance them is kind of straightforward, and it's a methodology that you see getting used all over the place. What's more interesting is whether there are other theoretical virtues that don't reduce to one or the other of those two. I'm inclined to think not. So I'm inclined to think that they're the only two, so that you can describe the methodology as um, one in which you just think about how you trade off simplicity against breadth and depth of explanation. But if, for example, so some people think, for example, that fit with established science is a theoretical virtue that's, that doesn't reduce to those two, whereas I'm inclined to think that it just gets subsumed under you know, exp you know, fit with the data, that one. Yeah, no, that was a very, I think, comprehensive answer to my question. And I definitely in concurrence with you that simplicity and explanatory power and scope are probably the only reliable virtues that we can use when evaluating different theories. Because when it comes down to it, those are really the only virtues that we can objectively verify or say lend actual probability to a specific hypothesis over another. Whereas if we accept other theoretical virtues, we're eventually left with a bunch of odious criterions and ways of evaluating theories that don't really get us anywhere. So 
yeah, I think that was a very comprehensive answer, and I think it's one that I agree with. So thank you. Okay, so I will say one thing, that it's it, it's not entirely straightforward to do this weighing of the you know, simplicity against um, explanatory breadth and depth. Um, it would be nice if it was easy, but it isn't. Uh, Dr. Oppie, <clears throat> we have Jonathan in line who's been waiting to ask you your question. Jonathan, take it away. Hi, Dr. Oppie. I want to thank you for coming on. Can you uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, so in recent years, like, it seems like there's been, and you'll, I think you actually wrote a paper on it, there's been an attack on, or divine, the doctrine of divine simplicity has come under a lot of fire, even from other theists. And I was wondering, one of the objections that's levied against it is that um, it would lead to modal collapse. And I'm just wondering if you think that that's actually a unique issue for that model of God, or if you think that that same objection could be levied against other models of God, as long as they think God is a necessary uh, being that causes contingent facts. Okay, so I don't think that um, it must be that if you think that there's a necessary origin, you're going to get modal collapse, because after all, my own view is of that kind, and I don't think you get modal collapse. What I think is closer, to, so so in the, I advertised before the book that I've got, forthcoming book with Kenny Pierce. In that, and, and I also mentioned um, Joss Rasmussen earlier in the discussion, they're both people who consider the idea that you should think of um, divine causation as chancy, right? And that would be one way of avoiding modal collapse, even if you have a, a, um, a view, a kind of very robust amount of necessity attributed to God. So not just God's existence, but God's properties and so on. I, th I don't see why if you have the view that the that divine causation is chancy, you can't get away with, um, you can't escape modal collapse if you're committed to divine simplicity. There might be other problems with the doctrine of divine simplicity, but I don't see why that's going to be one of them. Yeah, that, that was my intuition too, because it seems like you'll have people who want to say, well, if you think all of God's properties are, all of his real properties are necessary, then it follows that creation is necessary. But I feel like, you know, someone making that objection who also believes in a necessary being or necessary origin, if you use that same line of reasoning, you could just uh, run that same argument on their view. So I think I agree with you. Like, if you have like a agent causal account of creation, like that God agent caused the world or you know, that he has libertarian freedom, which I guess is what, I guess you would think that that's chancy. I think you would escape the modal collapse objection, even on divine simplicity. Do I have that right? Yeah, that's, that's, what, that's what I think. So I'm agreeing with you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. A really, really good question, Jonathan. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Abby, we have a couple of more questions, but j just to make sure, uh, you're fine with how the AMA is going and you're fine with the time so far? I mean, we don't want to take extra time. Uh, uh, from your I, I, I'm probably good for another 20 minutes or so. After that, I'll get okay. start to get tired and my answers will start becoming loopy, is what I expect. But... Okay, so... so uh, Dr. After... Can I just do a follow-up to Jonathan's question? Yeah, please. Can you comment on, I guess, Caesar has this sort of odd response to that type of objection. I was wondering if you could comment on where he says that God, God's um, property of being the creator of the universe is a Cambridge property. Are you familiar with, with this response that he gives? Um, I think I must have encountered it. Uh, I mean, I'm guessing it might be in the Five Ways, Five Proofs book, which I have read. Um, yeah, uh, I'm not sure that I fully understand that response, though. 
Yeah, that I don't understand either. That's why I was hoping you could say, say something about it, but maybe you're as mystified by it as I am. Um, Dr. Oppie, uh, Jack, were you done? I didn't mean to cut you off. Yeah, yeah, I'm done. Okay. <clears throat> Dr. Oppie, um, we have a question uh, from the president of Canadian Atheists who really admires you and your work and who would uh, <clears throat> like to get on. He happens to be a good friend of mine, uh, Randolph Richardson. Randolph, uh, meet Professor Graham Oppie. Oh, it's a pleasure to speak with you, Dr. Oppie. Hi. Um, I, I get involved in some debates and uh, usually debating with theists and the, there's a, a question that I've raised a few times and I, I'm, I'm hoping that I can, I'd be interested to know how it's reconciled with the philosophy of religion. I'll just state the question and, and, and a quick example of it. Uh, the question is uh, because a lot of theists I'm debating with will, will state that their, that their deity, excuse me, that their deity is um, both omniscient and omnipotent. And so, of course, I'm asking them how they reconcile, reconcile this paradox. And, and the example I give is, if the deity states truthfully that there's going to be rain in my city tomorrow, for example, and then I'm, and then tomorrow runs, rolls along, um, and then the deity changes the weather to sunshine or snow or something, uh, they've basically invalidated their omniscience from the day before. So yeah, I'm, I'm curious about how that can be reconciled in philosophy of religion, or if there may be something wrong with the approach that we're using here. I'm very curious to know your, your view on this. Thank you. Okay, so I'm, I'm wondering what's the basis of the worry here. So if we're, I, I take it that uh, um, there's a kind of division between theists who think that God's in time and theists who think that God sits out of time. The theists who think that God sits out of time are going to suppose that God doesn't change. At any rate, God doesn't change God's mind about anything. So it seems like on that way of thinking about things, your scenario is not going to arise because it's not going to be that God's at one point thinking, oh, I'm going to make it snow in Melbourne tomorrow. And then later he changes his mind and says, no, I'm not going to make it snow. I'll do something else. Right. So, okay. and, and I think of that kind of view as being associated with a sort of traditional theism. There are theists who, um, and so now I'm going to move to thinking about um, uh, uh, a different kind of theism. Theists who think that God's located in time, but not only is God located in time, God doesn't know anything about the future. Right. So. So he doesn't know anything about kind of um, indeterministic things that happen in the future. I mean, God m might know lots of kind of general stuff about the future, just like we do. But if you think about sort of particular details, like um, whether this particular atom is going to decay at this moment, or whether this person's going to make that decision at that moment, assuming that they've got libertarian freedom or whatever, on this view of thinking about it, God does, doesn't know that stuff. I mean what omniscience for God um, means is something like knowing everything that it's possible to know and there's just nothing to be known about the future. If you had that sort of view, then it wouldn't be that you were denying that God was omniscient. You'd just be saying that you've kind of, your question assumed the wrong view about omniscience because it assumed that God would have knowledge of things that nobody could have knowledge about. So on this other view, God could change his mind about things. He could have an intention to make it snow tomorrow, but he doesn't know that he's going to do that yet. And then we get closer to the date, you know, it's sort of later later on tonight, and he changes his mind and says, no, I'm not going to make it snow. And then it doesn't look like there's anything with respect to knowledge about tomorrow that God's kind of changed his mind about. Does so that, in a sense, does that make sense? The, yeah, so it sounds like in a sense, what you're 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 saying is the latter group is probably thinking of omniscience of 
knowing everything that has happened and everything about how reality works in the here and now as well. Um, but it just doesn't include predicting what's going to happen in the future. Yeah, that's that's right. Whereas um, for the sort of outside space and time view, generally the view is like Boethius's view. God sees the past, the present, and the future all in a kind of single glance, right? Mm. And there's and there's no there's no sort of before or after in the domain that God inhabits, and so the possibility of God changing his mind just doesn't arise. This is very interesting. Um, it's the best answer I've received so far. Um, it, typical answers are always, oh, it doesn't work like that, but then there's no elaboration on it. So thank you very much for your time and for this explanation. I, I, I greatly appreciate it. Randolph, uh, Randolph, can you, are you able to stick around after the AMA? I need to talk to you. I can stick around a little while. I'll, uh, if not, okay, I'll okay, good. No, but after the AMA is done, I prefer for you to stick around. I need to tell you something. Good. Oh, sure. I'll turn. Okay, good. That's all. Okay, uh, Professor Oppi, uh, without further ado, let's get back to dog. Oh, dog is deafened. Okay. Um, so here's another question that um, we had on for a long time. Um, do you believe that there is any um, validity to Aristotelian cosmological arguments? Even if they do not get you to the desired conclusion, do you believe that there is still uh, something that they do accomplish, or is it time to simply uh, retire them back to ash heaps of history? Thank you. So, I guess it, it depends exactly on the details of the argument. So, suppose that you're arguing, suppose that it's a kind of um, argument about efficient causation, right? So some things cause other things. There's no um, circles of causes. Nothing causes itself. There's no infinite regress of causes. And then you draw a conclusion. Now, there's premises in there that are controversial, whether there's a, you know, whether there's a big circle of causes or whether there's an infinite regress. Uh, but supposing that you accepted those things, what what conclusion are you going to get to? The conclusion that you'll get to is if you start from a particular cause in the present and you kind of trace it back, eventually you're going to get back to something that doesn't have a cause. But there was nothing in the assumptions that we made that was going to lead you to conclude that if you started with some other set of causes in the present and trace them back, they'd lead back to the same thing. So it looks as though there's a kind of hole in Aristotelian causal arguments that it's not clear how to fill, even if you accept the kind of controversial views about circles, you no know, you know, circles of causes and no um, infinite regress of causes. That doesn't mean, I suppose, that there's no interest that attaches to these arguments. After all, you can add in another premise that just says that there can only be one first cause, and then there can be at most one first cause, and then you'll get out the conclusion that there's exactly one. Uh, but I wouldn't take that as a proof of the existence of the initial singularity in my theory, right? I wouldn't even think that it was a particularly strong argument for it. And, I see. That's, yeah. That, that's presumably what I was expecting you to say along those lines. Okay, uh, question from Dog then. It's uh, Dog who has another question. Uh, why not? Dog, please. Hey, uh, Dr. Oppie. Yeah, so I wanted to... Well, the, the first thing I wanted to say is just something brief. Um, in regards to your comments about the whole, like, universals thing, uh, like, I think that, like, what if we just held to some sort of, like, def deflationary view um, when it, like, when we just say uh, that two two properties or two substances are, like, the same universal, right? All, it, all we're saying is that um, something about them like in the case of redness, I guess you could appeal to the physical properties there that causes the redness, right? It's just sufficient to say that they are they are the same. Like you, you don't really need to ground it in anything. 
particularly like magical or weird uh and um yeah my 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 other question is uh what do you think is by far the best argument for existential inertia ah okay so um so let me take the existential inertia question and i guess you can predict what my answer is going to be um here uh the the way that i that that i think about existential inertia is that um things go on i mean the principle is basically things will go on existing unless something causes them to stop existing and that seems like a very intuitive um principle we don't see things kind of just popping out of existence uh in the course of our experience uh, and we do so so the idea that you need some cause to preserve things in existence seems to me to be a kind of unnecessary principle that you're better off without right so this is just um part of the application of the methodology of sort of minimize your commitments maximize what you can explain uh existential inertia is highly explanatory um and does without other resources that you might want to appeal to to explain the same things namely the persistence of the existence of things over time so that's the that's the, the second question um the first question i'm not really sure what to say in response to um uh and you can have kind of deflationary may, maybe you can have a deflationary story about what it is for there to be universals uh um it's not clear what the difference between that would be and the kind of yablo account which or maybe the yablo account is just an instance of that kind of approach where you're allowed to go on using nominalization and saying quantifying over properties and so on but we just think that you're doing those things doesn't actually bring any theoretical commitments with it because all that's going on is that you're um that that you're being enabled to say things that otherwise would just require too long to say yeah that that's sort of my my thinking um i guess if you wanted to differentiate them i mean i'm not sure like would you, would yabo's view commit you to saying that like if i said these two things are red would that commit you to believing that uh they really are red or could i just call one red and the other one schmed and that would be um, equally true so so i mean yablo's got no possible no problems with predication so um, he'll be quite happy to say that thing's red that thing's red um, um there's no discriminating between them on account of their color um, he'll even allow you to say things like redness is a property that that thing has but that's just a different way of saying the thing is red right it's not like talking about the property suddenly brought in some extra commitment saying you know <laughs> redness is a property that it has doesn't commit you to more than that thing's red and according to the yablo story that thing's red doesn't commit you to anything more than the thing yes yeah, so I, I guess in, in that case it would just be sort of the same as my view um i guess um yes my my other my final question is what what are your objections to the objections people have brought up against existential inertia like for example in your debate with ed phaser or you know other objections people have made like what's the best objection and what's your best reply i guess is my question Hmm. Um so 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 one objection might be that there's kind of no principled way of um defending existential inertia. I mean that's something that people have said. That just seems false 
to me. Um, I'm not sure that there's anything very interesting to say by way of reply to that. And after all, when you're constructing your theory, you get to say what your basic principles are, and then you get to look to see what's explained by those principles. And it seems to me that uh, existential inertia is probably a principle that you should want. Perhaps excluding the case if you're um, the kind of theist who wants God to be sort of conserving the world in existence at every moment and, um, and, and so on. But then what's doing the work there is the kind of prior the theistic commitments. That's what's going to rule out existential inertia. If you're a naturalist, existential inertia looks like a kind of natural principle to adopt. Okay, um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rappi, for that response. And uh, we have one last question. We uh, won't take much more of your time. And it's come from Raskolnikov, the rest. Uh, please go ahead. Yeah, hi, Dr. Rappi. I have a quick question. So you said we have to compare uh, naturalism and theism based on theoretical virtues like simplicity and explanatory scope. But you often appeal to brute facts in in your naturalistic worldview, and do you think these are uh, these are theoretical vices, which would lead us to prefer theism, even though the theism might be uh, less parsimonious? So I think that uh, everywhere, so so postulating indeterminism is a theoretical cost. It would be much nicer, right, to um, to be able to say this system is deterministic because then all other possibilities are ruled out. There are no other possibilities. Whereas if you say it's indeterministic, there's other ways that things could have gone and there's nothing that explains why it goes the way that it did. So I think that um, brute contingency is always a theoretical cost, but there may be reasons why um, you want to postulate a certain amount of brute contingency. For example, if you believe in libertarian freedom, um, you know, with the principle of alternative possibilities, you're committed to it. You're committed to a certain range of brute contingency. And if um, the way that I'm understanding quantum mechanics is correct, then physics tells us that there's a certain amount of brute contingency in the world. So it's not that... Um, it's not going to necessarily be an objection to a view that it's got brute contingency in it. I mean, it's not like um, the view that, that Leibniz's view that there's just one possible world is immensely attractive. But that will that's the alternative to um, that's the alternative view if you don't accept that there's some unexplained contingency. The alternative is to say, well, everything's necessary, um, which I don't think is an attractive view. Okay. Uh, and uh, that concludes our official AFMA. Dr. Oppi, I want to thank you so much for this uh, enjoyable hour and 45 minutes. I speak for everyone here. Uh, it was thoroughly enjoyable uh, for you to come here, uh, take your time out of your busy schedule to address these questions, um, to hear so much input. You've done so with poise. Uh, you've done so with wonderful eloquence and comprehensiveness. I can't thank you enough for this event. Uh, I hope uh, you had a good time here. I certainly hope that's the case. Um, I apologize in advance if there was any questions maybe that got you off guard or anything. Um, but honestly, thank you so much for this uh, enjoyable time together. All good things must come to an end, they say, but um, certainly want to have nothing but kind words to say for you. And this was utterly uh, amazing and mesmerizing for us. Thank you again. So um, thanks everyone for your questions. I hope that you were happy enough with the thank answers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Krapian. Um, you know, let's uh, let's not lose each other. Let's stay in touch. And uh, your teaching, of course, starts in March. Um, and we will be, of course, looking forward to any new material that you will be releasing in new books. But in the meantime, I just want to offer nothing but a words. Thank you so much. And, uh, you know, um, we'll hope to see you again. Take care. Okay. Thank you. Um, Bye.